Uh, take your Bible, turn to Genesis uh, 6 and 7. It's kind of the general area that we're going to be uh, working in tonight. I appreciate those of you who are with us uh, here, those of you who are with us online. We appreciate that. May the Lord bless you. And uh, we hope always to be a blessing uh, to you as well. There's a lot of things going through my mind that uh, we can talk about tonight in relation to the ark and maybe just questions that people have. Um, I will, well, let's, let's read some scripture and then we'll go to the Lord uh, in prayer. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, verses 1 through 4, we'll start there and then uh, we'll go to the Lord. Uh, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also was flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. So we, we think that uh, from the time that God mentioned this, that that's about the time then that he spoke to Noah and the time frame that he gave Noah to build this ark was 120 years. That sounds about long enough. I mean, my goodness, government projects take less time than that. If the government can do it, we can do it, all right? So 120 years, and uh, so we would have think then that at the end of this 120 year period, God was done striving with man. His spirit was done working. It, it just seems like man now is working against God's spirit, wanting nothing of what God has to offer them. So it says in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. Do you believe that? And also after that, you believe that, after the days of Noah, after the flood, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Let's keep reading a few more verses. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me, or it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Heavenly Father, pray God that you would bless our study of your word tonight. I pray, Lord, that it would reach around the world. Father, that it would build and increase faith in people's hearts and minds. Father, that it remind us, God, that you are a just God, that you have dealt and you will again deal with the wickedness of man. But, Father, that there is also not just justice, Father, but grace and mercy in your eyes. And, Lord, help those who seek for mercy and who seek for grace find it, Lord, in you. We thank you, God, for your word. Father, help us, and help us to believe it. Help us to trust in it, Father Lord, in the face of all the doubt of this world. Help us to trust your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, again, I, was, uh, I mentioned this uh, earlier today. Now, I was doing a little bit of research on, you know, Noah's Ark and how big it was and different things like that. And was reading some, uh, I guess, a Wikipedia article. Wikipedia always gets it right. You know they do. And uh, that uh, earlier in the 1800s, the scholars all agreed that they believed that all of the animals that, you know, should have been on the earth or on the ark were in fact on the ark and that there was no doubt that what the Bible said was true. That was in the early 1800s. And then later on in the 1800s, and I can say that a lot of things were going on in the latter 1800s. You had what amounts to a revival of hell. Hell turning, unleashing on the earth. Uh, you had um, Charles Darwin, Helena Blavatsky, 
You had the uh, occult revival in France. You had a lot of occultism in France. And that was coming over into the United States and, and affecting a lot of people's thoughts. You had Aleister Crowley. Uh, you had all of those people, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were just very, very wicked in their thought. Co and you had Tischendorf. You had uh, West Cotton Hort, who were at that same time taking the Word of God, revising it, basing it upon these new manuscripts that they found in the Vatican vault and in that monastery in Mount Sinai. So you had this, this turnover of thought in the late 1800s. Coincidentally then, you have the scholars then looking at uh, the animal kingdom and saying, there's no way that Noah could have gotten these animals on the ark. The ark wasn't big enough. There's no way that could have happened. And so we doubt now whether or not this story ever really occurred, okay? Whereas before, you had people believing it. Afterward, they don't believe it anymore. And I'm reading that, and, you know, again, my mind is saying, well, you know, if they thought that there's no way they could get them on the ark, maybe they couldn't get them on the ark for about a half a second. And then I said, you know what? That's God's word. God's not a man. That he should lie. Why would I believe man when I can believe God? Why would I let man tell me that God's a liar when God tells me that man's a liar? Amen. I'll believe God who said that he never lies. So I believe it. I believe that the animals that were supposed to be on that ark were on that ark. Okay, and, I, and anyway, I'll get to that here in a little bit. Let's deal with these giants first. Uh, I pointed that out last week, last Sunday night. Look up on the screen. Um, in the old newspapers from the 1800s, up and there on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, somebody put together a map of reports of finding giant skeletons in various caves, pits, wells, different things like that. Burial grounds, burial mounds. I happened upon a book. I have it in my office. You were taking a peek at it. Um, it was at the uh, Goodwill store. It cost me two inches. See, they, at this Goodwill store, you buy books by the inch. And this one was about, to, about, tw about 20 cents an inch, so about 40 cents it cost me. It's about that thick, and it's a book about all the pyramids that they found in Mexico. And it's the early finders of those pyramids. So it's just interesting to me. But in all these burial mounds, all these caves, and all these places like that, up there on the screen is... Basically, where these old newspapers were reporting that so-and-so went into a certain cave and found giant bones. Bones belonging to men who must have been 7, 8, 9, 10 feet tall, things like that. They were in the Americas. And as European settlers went from the east and traveled west, they would set up, they would set up towns and little villages everywhere and as people settled there they would naturally go out and look at the territory they would look and see what's around they would you know discover the woods and like I used to do when I was a kid well they would find they would go in these old caves and they would find large bones inside these caves they would then collect these things they sent them to Smithsonian Institute these articles would say these bones were shipped to the Smithsonian Institute but for some reason, the Smithsonian Institute has no record whatsoever of any of these bones in their collection. Not one. Whereas you have all these newspaper articles from all over the country, back in the 1800s, saying they found large bones, sent them to the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian's going, what bones? Okay? It's a cover-up here. And if you don't, uh, listen, it's easy for me to believe that. It is easy for me to believe that in the upper echelons of scientific knowledge, there is a massive
massive cover-up of evidence that doesn't match their theory. And if it doesn't match their theory, it's cast aside. There are dinosaur bones and dinosaur eggs that are found in layers where they're not supposed to be. And when they're found in a layer that they're not supposed to be, that is obviously an erroneous thing. We move it out of the way, now it doesn't exist. And our theories are still intact. That much I absolutely believe. So here's the question. I always ask people that, you know, who say they believe the Bible, do you believe the Bible enough to believe that, that giant men of large stature roamed the earth, built cities, built monuments, built walls and things that no mortal man could have built. Do you believe that? I want you to take your Bible. Turn to uh, Numbers chapter 13 very quickly. I just felt like God wanted me to, to cover this part of it. It came to my mind just before the service started, so I'm going to deal with it very quickly. Do you believe that giants roam the earth? If you don't, then you've got some serious theological issues to deal with. Because God in the New Testament teaches his doctrine of salvation by faith. He bases it, he teaches it based upon the story of there were giants. And if you don't believe that they were giant men of huge stature who built walls that were so big that the, the men who spied this out were just going... Where's the top of it? I don't know. Numbers chapter 13. Verse 25. They returned from searching out of the land after 40 days. The 12 spies. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came into the land where thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. God wasn't kidding, was he? Twelve men went in for forty days. They come back and then said, That land is flowing with milk and honey. Nevertheless, oh, but here's the problem. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb had a different spirit in him, didn't he? He said, Let's go, boys. God's going to give it to us. God swore. God made a promise to us. Why should we not believe him? Verse 31, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. Very important. The, the evil report is the exact opposite of good tidings of great joy. Isn't it? The good tidings of great joy tells you you can go to heaven. The evil report says not so much. Okay? And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. All the people were men of great stature. So I want you to underline that, and if anybody ever questions you about how evil God is, how that God would tell Joshua and all his, his soldiers to kill every man, woman, and child, you point to this verse and say, they were giants. All the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our, in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. That's why God told them to kill them. They were beasts. They were hybrids. Okay? They were an aberration to God. God abhorred them. And so anyway, uh, if we, if, let's, uh, let's see here. Verse 4 of chapter 14. 
they said one to another, let us make a, a captain and let us return into Egypt. So right then and there, upon that statement, God swore in his wrath, they'll never see, they're going to rot in the wilderness, they're never going to see my kingdom. Turn to the book of Hebrews, if you would. Hebrews. Chapter 3. Verse 10. Wherefore, why? Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhorting one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I had a visitor in my office this afternoon. Okay, I'm not going to say who it was, but you know him. Uh, some of you have been around here for a while. He has been struggling. Him and his wife have been struggling. He, had, he confessed some sins to me. And he was broken. I mean, he was shaking in my office. And I was looking at him and I was smiling like I am now. Do you know why? Because I'm seeing God deal with a man about his sin. When you're shaking like that and you're weeping like that, he was, listen... He was scared to death. God had left him. And I said, no, he hasn't. And I said, the proof is you're right here. I said, you could have gone to the bar. You could have gone back to the old sins. You could have just, you could have just turned your head and said, I, I go fishing like Peter did. I'm out of here. I'm done. I, I've had it. I, there's no way in the world. I said, you came seeking me and this church out. That is proof right there that God has not left you. He said, but I'm afraid God's uh, punishing me. And I said, I'm not afraid he is. I know he is. And I read him Hebrews 12. And I said, if you weren't a son, God wouldn't touch you. God would have, you know what God would have done? He would have seared your conscience with a hot iron. And it would not have been bothering you things you've been doing. You'd have kept, you'd have been, in fact, you would have been there right now instead of in my office bawling your eyes out. And we prayed and he confessed to God and we got done. I said, you feel better? He said, yeah, I do as a matter of fact. And he said, I'll be here Sunday. You, some of you probably already know who I'm talking about. You pray for him and his wife, all right? Just lift him up. But I'm just telling you, sin will drive you to unbelief. Your sin will drive you to unbelief. Watch it. Watch it. And sin are giants. Arrgh. Right? And you look at them and you say, I can't defeat them. That's what he was telling me. He said, I can't. I can't. I can't quit. So I know it. Hallelujah. Praise God. I told him, I said, man, I'm glad you're here. You just made my whole day. And I'm not trying to make fun of the man. Because I just saw a broken man. And I saw what sin had done to him. It run its course. And he said, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. That's exactly where God wanted you. Okay? And uh, he was worried about coming in here. But I told him, I said... This is a support group. Sinners Anonymous. Okay? You ain't sitting in a room with a bunch of people who think they're better than you. So don't think that they're going to think otherwise. And I like this church because of that. I'll, I'll keep being your pastor. All right? Anyway, verse 13, but exhort one another daily. It's what we're supposed to be doing. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. God would have let every Jew in that camp walk into Canaan land with a high hand. Like they came out of Israel with a high hand. He would have let them walk into Canaan land with a high hand 
Had they just believed what Caleb was telling them, had they just believed it, God would have done the miracle of killing every giant, tearing down every wall like he did with Jericho, and just running all those people out one city at a time. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation for some. And the provocation, the provocation is what you just read in Numbers 13 and 14. If giants are not real, this whole thing that he's, he's teaching in Hebrews is a big, fat lie. If Numbers 13 and 14 is not true, exactly the way the Bible says it. Those ten, those ten men told the truth about what they saw. And they said, we cannot go in. So if what they were saying was not true, then God misjudged Israel. I want you to ponder that. If what those men said was not true, then God judged Israel falsely. Because they were scared to go in because of the giants. At no time do you read in there where God said, hold on, hold on a second. That's not what they saw. That's not what they, they just saw villages and people walking back and forth. It was just like they, they were. I don't know where they got this giant thing. They, made, they made, must have made that up. But that's not, I, I don't have a problem with them thinking that they're just normal people. That's, you don't see God correcting them in there. You see God saying, I know there's giants in there. Why don't you go in anyway? God believed in them. Israel believed in them. The writer of Hebrews believed in them. And if you don't believe in them, where's your faith? For some, though he had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And it had everything to do with Numbers 13 and the fact that they saw giants and great walled villages that they knew that they could not physically conquer. They saw men who were of very large stature. They brought back food that for some reason was huge. I've never seen a, great, a cluster of grapes so big it had to be carried. John, you're... You're a great man. You're a raisin man. You're a vine keeper. Have you ever seen a cluster of grape so big it had to be carried by two men on pole hanging on their shoulders? It's never been seen before. But I believe what this Bible says about them. Okay? Trust this Bible alone. Quit reading stuff on the internet that will mess with your mind. Okay? Don't, don't fool with that stuff. Alright? Alright. Now, back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. God's going to deal. God's going to deal with this earth. He's going to punish. He's going to judge. So he says in Genesis 6, 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. I'm going to stop right here. I just, last night in my study, I had verified for me what I've been saying about where the Bible says perfect in his generations. I had that verified. Because what I did was, I want you to look up on the screen very quickly. I'm kind of moving ahead here. But who remembers this from biology class? The classification of the animal and plant kingdom. It starts out with kingdom. You have two kingdoms. Plant an animal. And I'm pretty sure a duck-billed platypus even goes in both the animal and plant. I think it's got like roots. and no, I'm just making that up. The duck-billed platypus, they don't know what family to put it in. Is it a mammal? But it lays eggs? They don't, it's messed up. I think God's just going <laughs> Okay? But anyway, the kingdoms are the plant animal kingdom. The phylum. I don't ask me to remember about how all this is organized, okay? Phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, okay? The word genus is where the word generations 
and genealogy and Genesis comes from. Genus. And I found, reading through these articles last night, trying to remind myself of these classifications, the word genus. The lat is a Latin word. And are you ready for this one? You know what it means? Huh? Nah. You're way off. It means race. Dun, dun, dun. Noah was perfect in his generations, his genus, his race. Now that is, I'm not saying racial purity, racial pride, Black Lives Matter, KK, I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying to you is, when the Bible said that Noah was perfect in his generations, his genus, his genealogy, his genetics had not been defiled. And remember, Noah's son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, they patronized, they were the fathers of the three primary races of man. Mongoloid, Negroid, Caucasoid. Alright? So, all three of those races are pure races coming from the pure man, Noah. No defilement in any of those three races, those three genuses, no defilement by an outside source. Does everybody follow me on that? Okay, that's what Genesis 6 is telling you. These are the generations, the genuses of Noah. Uh, by the way, who knows how we... Humans are classified. What are we as far as genus and species? The genus is homo. The species is sapien. Do you know what the word sapien means? Sapien has to do with knowledge. Somebody look sapien up. Sapiento is the Latin word. Okay? And I think it has to do with our knowledge and understanding, our self-awareness. Okay? Somebody look that up. Somebody Google sapien. What does that mean? All right? And then raise your hand when you get it. They can Google something. I'm going to use the technology until it gets under my skin. Then I'll back away. All right? Anyway, so these are the generations, the genuses of Noah, the races of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his genus. In his species, in his in his uh, his race, as a human being, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold. I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, man has corrupted the earth. I'm going to destroy man with the earth. Yes, Alicia. Being wise, self-aware, okay? Meaning, we have a soul. We are, we are classified as being different from every other species on the whole earth in that we are sapient. We are self-aware. We have a soul. A man, let me explain it like this, okay? Can you right now picture yourself sitting in this room? In your mind. Okay? You are, you are aware of yourself. You have self-awareness. Okay? You're not always governed by training or... What's the other word? Um, instinct. You're not governed by 
whether someone trained you, coerced you, or you can make yes and no decisions that even go against instinctiveness. Does that make sense? Okay? You have that ability. Animals do not have that. Plants don't have the ability. Okay? That's what makes you different from everything else. God breathed into the sapiens, the soul. Okay? Man becomes a living creature. He's sapien. He is wise about himself. All right? Appreciate that. So anyway, so God's going to destroy the earth. Regardless of everything else, God has seen it. He's had enough of it. He's going to destroy the earth. So now let's look at verse 14. Genesis chapter 6. All right? So this is... This is um, uh, he told Noah, he said, the end of all flesh has come before me. So now here's the preparation. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. From what I could find, the idea, the common theory is that gopher wood was the type of carpentry that they were using. Okay? Maybe of a laminated wood or wood fitted together. Okay? It wasn't any particular kind of tree that they were using, it had probably had to do, this is all guesswork, but it probably had to do with the carpentry of the wood itself. Take the wood and gopher it, which means something. Fitting it together, okay? Anyway, rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. What was the pitch for? What was it? It was tar. They were waterproof, this ark. Now, one of the qualities of wood is that they, when they make boats out of wood, okay, it'll leak like a sieve when you first put it in water until the wood swells. Uh, somebody help me out. Guys working in shops with hammers. The heads come off of wooden handles. What do they do with those wooden handles? Put them in a bucket. You're the one I heard it from then. Guys had put hammers in a bucket of water and that makes the head swell so that or the wood swell so the hammerhead wouldn't come off. Old ships that they made out of wood, they get that wood as tight as they can against one another and put it in the water and it leaks like crazy for a while. But then that wood soaks in that water and it swells and it becomes tight as a drum. So the pitch within and without is to help aid that. But the bottom line is the wood is going to do what God designed wood to do. And that is swell when it gets wet so that it seals all the cracks. That, that ark, watch this now, was safe the whole year. That this ark was on that water, it was completely safe. Noah and his family did not have to worry about that ark sinking. Didn't have to worry about it. The way it was designed, let's look at the way it was designed. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. I break this down in a minute. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. The height of it, 30 cubits. By the way, all of these numbers have a ratio to them. Okay? They're part of a sequence of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. They are like the sequence is called God's ratio. It is in everything in the world. Okay? Who in here has ever had a 3 by 5 note card in their hand? A 3 by 5 note card, for some reason, just is the perfect size for a note card. Your credit card is about the same size too, three by five. The three by five here is in this arc multiplied by 10, 30 by 50, by 300. It's a perfect ratio, I don't have time to get into it. But anyway, a window shalt thou make to the ark, and, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. Remember, this ark is a picture of Christ. One, two, three. Because in Christ, you have the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that in Christ, you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. All right? So anyway, it's a picture of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. That's why there are three levels in it. But the three levels also is practical as well. The bottom level, Noah would have put all of the stores in the bottom level. 
would have put probably the elephants in the bottom level, the big animals in the bottom level, all of the waste that they collected would have been in the bottom level, everything heavy in the bottom level. Why? Buoyancy, to keep it from being top heavy, okay? That's why you have three levels. You put birds and grasshoppers at the top. You put the elephants and rhinoceroses and hippopotamuses and the pterodactyls and the tyrannosauruses and the brontosauruses, yes. You put behemoth in the bottom. We'll get, talk about that in a minute. Okay, anyway, uh, verse um, second, lower second, third story, shalt thou make it. Behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. Thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind. Very important word. Fowls after their kind. Out of cattle after their kind. Of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Notice this. Two of every sort shall come to thee. Noah did not have to go out hunting for animals. God made two giraffes, a male and a female, walk away from their... I don't know how giraffes are as far as a group is concerned. I don't know what you call them. But a herd of giraffes, two of them left the herd and walked to Noah. They showed up one day. Two dogs showed up. Two rabbits showed up. Two snakes showed up. Two, what else? Huh? Two bears showed up. Two deer showed up. Two hogs showed up. Two mosquitoes showed up. Okay? Okay. They just walked up to Noah. And Noah took them in. It was that simple. Two tigers, two lions showed up. Okay? They just walked in the ark. And Noah put them where they were supposed to be. That's how simple. God made this thing very simple. That's what God said. He said, I'll bring them. Two of every sort shall come to thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten. Thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Take a look up on the screen, the dimensions. 300 cubits long, by 50 cubits wide, by 30 cubits high. Notice the ratio of this. Notice the design of this thing. Because of the long length of it. And the wide base of it. It was wider than it was high. This is to make it stable. There wasn't a wave that could have been generated that could have turned this thing over. I remember there was a uh, movie that came out in the 70s, Search for Noah's Ark. And they, there was a, a, a test run. They made a test model of the ark based upon the proportions there. And they put it in a, in a water chamber, to te one, a chamber that they used to test the stability of boats and ships that they make. And they put this thing and they exerted every, against it every wave that they could come up with. And they could not make this thing turn over. God knew what he was doing. And I want you to listen to this now. This is, this is designed to help us to think about how God does things. With the properties of wood that Noah used. With the pitch. With the design of it. The, the width being wider than the height of it. The length of it being as long as it was. God was going to make sure that the physical properties of this boat was of such that it was never, ever, ever going to sink. Now you listen to me. They refer to us as the, being the old ship of Zion. I like songs that talk about the old ship of Zion. I like that idea. That ship is not going to sink, people. And when God puts you in it, 
You're in it. You think about that. When God puts you in the ark, you are in the ark. You're not hanging on the side outside somewhere. You're not going to fall out of the window. There's only one window and there's only one door. And God shut that door. Something going on? Praise the Lord. Well, I'm talking about the flood. Amen. Look, go look for the rainbow, somebody, because I know it's got to be there. Okay? But this ark is designed like salvation is designed. When God saves, He saves. When God keeps, He keeps. Eight people walk on that ark. Eight people walk off of that ark. By the way, that shows you that God also is in control of population. Eight people walk off the ark, not nine. Not eight people and their children. Eight people went off of that ark. Okay? God kept the animals. Is there windows rolled down? Yeah. I bet there are. Okay? Who would have thought this one? Amen? Anyway, oh my goodness. Everybody go roll your windows up. I'll finish up. All right? But when God designed salvation, it saves people. God has a sure way of saving people. In fact, I mean, you've heard me mention this before. The very thing that destroyed the sinners is what lifted up the saints. Somebody say amen. This is number one. It's historical. It's over with. I think God's laughing harder than you guys are. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. Number one, this is historical. Again, Jesus himself referred to this and said how this was is how the future is going to be. If you don't believe the Bible in its history, you do not believe it in its prophecy. Because if God said, this happened this way, and you believe the scholars who say, it didn't really happen this way, then why in the world would anybody want to believe the Bible concerning what's going to happen in the future? Because it hasn't even happened yet. I'm just, boy, I'm big on this thing. I'm not for all this nonsense. Well, you know, evolution. Yeah, there was evolution. Yeah, we, we think it did probably take place over millions of years and all this stuff. Yeah, there was a flood, but it wasn't, you know, that covered the whole land. It is a bunch of nonsense. I don't go for that. I don't follow that stuff. The Bible says it happened this way, then it happened exactly this way. And I guarantee you this thing was 300 cubits long to the inch. It was 50 cubits wide. 450 cubic cubits. If we use 18 inches as a cubit. Broken down in feet. 450 feet long. That is a football field and part of another one. 75 feet wide. 45 feet high. 1,518,750 cubic feet of space that's what you have on the ark okay that is a lot of room okay when you have three floors of it now watch this how many animals I don't know but the key is the word kind verse 20 of fowls after their kind cattle after their kind creeping thing of the earth after his kind so you have three types of life. Flying animals. The word cattle would reference basically all sorts of mammals with four legs. Then you have every creeping thing. Snakes, reptiles, bugs. And keep this in mind now. God said that he would bring them to Noah and he did exactly that. Now watch this. What you get out of this is God governing the beast nature. God's in charge of the animals. Noah was not afraid of the bears, 
and the lions. He was not afraid of them. Even after they were on the ark. What is it that we know that a lot of animals do for certain months out of the year? They sleep. You don't have to take care of sleeping animals. And it may very well have been that a large majority of these animals slept the whole time. God put them in a stasis, a hibernation. Did you know that even humans, it is in our nature, it is in our biology to pack on weight before wintertime. It's in our nature. Everybody does it. It's just, it's just common. That's how it is. That's how God designed us in our nature. Okay? And to become more active with the sun and the heat and the things like that. I mean, it's, this is just how it is. And God is governing all of this. God is governing the beast as they are on this ark. So I don't have a problem. With number one, the fact that eight people tended the animals while they were on the ark. Because it is very well within the scope of believability that God put most of them asleep. Okay? Now, only the animals that were on the ark survived the flood. Correct? So that begs the question. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Okay. Does anybody know how big the biggest brontosaurus or anything like that was? Michaela's going. They were huge, weren't they, Michaela? Go to these museums, you see those bones. I don't, I don't doubt the skeletal record at, at all. I don't doubt it. I think these creatures were humongous, towering 75, 100 feet, maybe even more. Stretched out, they could reach unimaginable heights. But we know by way of the fossil record, we have the eggs fossilized that every one of them started out this big. So, did Noah have these two full adult 500 year old brontosauruses walking up? Boom, boom, boom to walk in the ark? Probably not. He had young, newly born reptiles walking in. Okay? How do I know this? Job chapter 40. Turn there. Verse 15. Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. Day six, God created all of the beasts of the earth, and he created man on the same day, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. So we know he's not an ox. He's a behemoth. He's bigger than an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. That is not a hippopotamus. It is not an elephant. His tail is huge like a cedar. Cedars are big trees. The redwoods of California, those are cedars, aren't they? Am I right in that? The conifers, they're like pines or something like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but anyway. He moved his tail like a cedar. The sinews, huh? We're in Job 40, verse 17. He moved his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Now I want you to think about something, something I heard on a deal about dinosaurs here a while back. Uh, the size of the creature has has um, there's an issue with the size of any creature as the creature the bigger the creature is since it's a mammal is more likely warm-blooded or even reptiles you have a heat problem the bigger the animal the bigger the heat problem God gave elephants big ears for what reason they fan themselves they fan away heat from their bodies with their big ears Hippopotamuses are huge animals, but where do they dwell? 
They're water horses. That's what hippopotamus means. They dwell in the water and keep themselves cool. Where does Behemoth live? He always lives in the shade. That's where he lives. To stay out of the heat of the sun so, he's, so the shade and the wind in the shade can dissipate the heat from his body. Okay, anyway, behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Now, Jordan is not a huge river, but it is pretty decent in size. And this beast can go over to the river Jordan and open his mouth and draw it up. And you would be downstream knowing that Behemoth was drinking out of that river. Because it would go down until he stopped drinking. And then you'd see the water come back down. So anyway... There's no doubt in my mind that Behemoth was a very, very large creature similar to the dinosaurs that they dug up that lived 65 million years ago. Not. Okay? Did they make it onto the ark? Yes. Were they big? I don't think so. Did they survive the flood? Yes. But not too long afterward. And I don't want to get into all that. It gets into... Vapor canopies and all that stuff, and I don't want to talk about that, but I do want to talk about this, and then I'll let you go. Back up on the screen in Genesis 19, or Genesis 6, 19 and 20, the key to the animals being on the ark of fowls after their kind, of cattle after their kind, creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Now, the word kind here, I think, involves family. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. You have the canine family. You have two representatives, a male and a female, from the canine family. Every wolf, dog, dingo, every version of canine was represented by these two canine animals. What were they? I don't know. But they were the kind and every, what kind of dog is yours? Terrier Retriever Mix, okay? Your dog was in the loins of these two dogs that were on the ark, okay? We have a Shih Tzu. Who else has a dog? You might have, you have a dog? What kind? Shih Tzu. Terrier? Well, you guys like these mixed up breeds, don't you? Okay? Every one of them, from dingoes to the wild dogs of Africa to the wolves of the plains, every one of them represented in these two dogs after their kind. They carried the genetic material then after they came off the ark, they carried the genetic material of every other species of dog and subclass of dog. Same thing with the equine family. Every breed of horse on that ark only in twos. Serpents by two. Bovine family by seven. Why did I say that bovines by seven? They were clean. Serpents and the horses and the dogs, they were not. The bovines were clean. They were on there by sevens. Now, somebody suggested to me that that means that there was 14 of them. You, you, if you re look at Genesis 7, you might see that there. And I'm going, maybe so. The male and his female of seven. Because you're going to have an oddball. You got six on there that are male and female. You got an oddball on there. What do you do with that one? Okay? I don't know. But anyway. So does that kind of help you a little bit? That not every single little breed of animal was on the ark. But they were after their kind. More than likely, they stopped where the family is there. And you had two of the canine family, two of the equine family, two of the bovine family, or whatever. And they carried in them the genetics of all the genuses and the species underneath them. So now you've limited the number that has to be on the ark in order for their seed to survive. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Whether I'm right on this or not, you've got to believe that God destroyed everything when he destroyed the earth in Genesis 7. And that a representation of every animal that now exists on this planet was on that ark. Because if you don't believe it in the past, you can't believe it for the future. 
And Jesus is the one who linked it for us. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So I believe that God knows how to save people from this world and take them to the next one. Because that's the picture that you have with Noah and the ark. Amen? He kept that seed alive. All right, let's stand to our feet. Next Sunday night, we're going to discuss that flood. Why is it important? Why do we have to believe this stuff? Because the Bible. If you're going to believe God, you take the whole package. All of it. God sent his servants, the prophets, and they wrote down what he said. And there cannot be one of them that lied. Because if Moses lied in writing down the book of Genesis, then we don't have to listen to Moses. And if we don't see Moses wrote Genesis, Moses also gave the law. And if Moses was wrong about the book of Genesis, then you and I cannot be brought under condemnation of the law. Which means that everybody gets to go to heaven. Right? That's not how it is. Okay? Anyway, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for this book. Thank you for what it says, what it means. Father, we believe it. I believe it. And Lord, even though I read what the liars said, you helped me remember that they were liars and that you're true. They were calling you a liar, and yet, Father, you called them a liar, and I believe you. Because, God, I know that you have never lied to me. You've always told me things good and straight, Father. You've told me things right about issues of life. You've told me things, Lord, that were right about me. You've told me things that were right about other people. And God, I have no reason in my heart to believe that you ever did lie or you ever will lie. And God, I believe what this Bible says about earth's history. I've believed it for most of my life. I've based my everlasting eternal salvation on it. And God, I know you don't lie. So what this book says about earth's past and earth's history and earth's geology and everything, Lord, that the scientists say is wrong, your word is right. Father, build faith in us. Help us, dear God, to be in agreement with your word. And Father, help us to see it then as happening maybe in our lifetime. Maybe, Lord, that's why you are preparing this generation the way you are. So Father, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly according to your word. Bless and honor this book. Bless and honor these people, Father. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.